This podcast is brought to you by Prolongevity, the award-winning eight-week program that can transform the lives of people with prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and many other lifestyle-related illnesses. Founded by Graham Phillips, the pharmacist who gave up drugs. So, uh, welcome uh, everyone to another edition of the Prolongevity podcast. My guest today is Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, GP extraordinaire, um, has a fascinating insight into the whole cardiovascular area, um, has written numerous books, um, one of which, Doctoring, Doctoring Data, Malcolm, I found fascinating. I was going to cover it with you today, but actually yeah. so important um, that I'd like to um, preempt the discussion by inviting you back on another occasion to discuss that. Uh, I've learned, there are certain people who are icons for me and for whom I've learned a tremendous amount on my own health uh, and advisory journey. And um, Malcolm's latest book, The Plot Thickens, uh, otherwise known as The Clot Thickens, uh, aptly named, and it describes the whole way that cardiovascular uh, da uh, damage develops, uh, heart attacks and strokes and so on and so forth. And Without um, spoiler alert, Malcolm, I, I just, as I said to you earlier on, I think, it's an area that I've struggled with for many, many years, and I've read an awful lot on this subject. And it's not, you know, um, an area I learned a lot when I was at university, but I learned the fundamental science. And for the first time ever, I think I've got a, 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 you know, a proper grasp of this subject, and that's entirely down to you. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for this wonderful book. Everyone should read it. Now, um, this is an area that's incredibly complex. And I'm sure even in your book, you don't deal with all the biomolecular complexity. And I listened to a wonderful podcast with you recently on Nourish, Balance, Balance, Thrive, and they do go into the complexity. So my aim today is to kind of bridge between the understanding of an interested lay individual and the, the more complex area that you covered in Nourish, Balance, Thrive, and we'll link to that in the show notes. But I thought we'd kind of go through um, a few myths and then uh, at the end, maybe look at what, what we could do. So kind of brings me uh, to my first question, which is cholesterol. Because we hear about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And as you so beautifully explain in the book, medical terminology is both confused and confusing. And I want to start off by not making the mistake of discussing good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, because neither of those things exist, there's just cholesterol, and say, number one, what is cholesterol? Um, and number two, why is it of such fundamental importance? And let's lay this myth to bed right at the start. Right. Well, <laughs> it does, uh, as everyone finds it, gets complicated. Uh, cholesterol is just a chemical, it has a formula something like C27H46016 or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah for reasons that are in inexplicable, um, we decided to call something else that we measure in the bloodstream cholesterol, and, and that is a lipoprotein. Now, lipoproteins are, if you like, the taxis that move cholesterol around inside your body. So they're, they're, they're made in the liver primarily, and, and then as they move around the body, they lose um, fats or fatty acids and then they contain considerably more cholesterol. So, so there is no such thing as cholesterol in your bloodstream. It doesn't exist. There are these little taxis, little spheres that carry it around. The reason for this is that cholesterol is not soluble in water and therefore wouldn't be soluble in blood. So it would just clump together in big clumps wherever it went. So it has to be protected from, from water. Otherwise, it just, just it, it, we'd have a nightmare on your hands. So. So people decided to call a substance in your blood that isn't cholesterol, cholesterol, and from then on, no one's understood what anyone's talking about. So let's just talk about what cholesterol is and what it does and why it's a fundamental. I mean, no, the, if you have no cholesterol, it, it's incompatible with life, just like not having oxygen. And yet, if you kind of get the drift from the medical orthodoxy, the less cholesterol, the better. And that's absolutely untrue. So let's just say a little bit about what cholesterol does in the body and why it's of fundamental importance to life. Well, cholesterol is a, it's a substance that's found um, in, well, one thing I sometimes say to people is, why do you think an egg yolk has got so much cholesterol in it? And um, I said, it's because it takes an awful lot of cholesterol to build a healthy chicken. Um, as it requires an awful lot of healthy 
of cholesterol to build a healthy human being. It's really one of the most fundamental uh, molecules we have. Um, it's part of our, what they call the cell membranes. Human, uh, um, animals have cell membranes and plants have cell walls. Our cell membranes have cholesterol within them, if you like, to help deform all sorts of critical, um, what they call rafts that allow the transfer of, of molecules in and out of cells. It also maintains the structure of the, of the cell membrane. Without cholesterol, the cell membrane would disintegrate and all your cells would disintegrate and you would be instantly dead. Um, another thing that the, the, the basic cholesterol is a building block for an awful lot of hormones in your body. So, so things like um, um, cortisol um, and vitamin D is actually the basic structure of vitamin D is cholesterol, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, adrenaline. These, these hormones are all based on the, the, the cholesterol molecule with different attachments to one side or the other. And the other thing that the other couple of things that cholesterol is hugely important for within the brain, your synapses are really almost pure cholesterol. So your synapses are things that the communication gaps between neurons are cholesterol rich. And, and the, um, the sheaths that surround your neurons, the myelin sheaths are very high in cholesterol. And in fact, in the brain, because the lipoprotein that carries cholesterol can't actually get into your brain. The brain has to synthesize its own cholesterol in order to meet its needs. So 25% of the dry weight of your brain, for example, is cholesterol. So that just gives you some examples of how critical it is. So I, I hope even if some of that's a bit technical for the listener or the viewer, the point here is that the cholesterol molecule is fundamental to life. It's so important that, that I think the majority of the cells in the body uh, make their, can make cholesterol. And this idea that there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol is ridiculous because there's only one version of cholesterol. It's, you know, as you said, it's, it's the basis of our brain, the basis of our hormones. Uh, it's in every cell membrane. And just logically, why would two million years of evolution go to the trouble of producing something like this that was bad for us? So I think that's myth number one laid to rest, if you like. And I'd like to pause here slightly and ask a little bit about you, because um, you've got this incredible ex expertise around cardiovascular disease, but you've got a day job too as a GP. So tell us a little bit about, about your GP practice um, and you know where the kind of area that you serve and what your um, patients look like. Well, at the moment, I'm no longer a partner in general practice. I work in um, what they call intermediate care primarily, which is dealing with elderly people who had a, a crisis in their existence, full on a broken a leg or had an acute infection. And what we're trying to do is um, is get them back on their feet and get them back into the community. That's my my main day job. I also work in, uh, in what we call antivirus, seeing people as semi or emergencies in the antivirus system. And I do some local general practice, but I'm not a partner in a general practice currently. And increasingly, <laughs> very few GPs see that as a as a, as a long term role at the moment. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. that's a whole other discussion. As you know, my 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 partner is uh, in life is a, is a GP, and she's just handed a notice in for probably the same kind of pressures. But you were a partner in a GP practice. I was um, a couple of times in Scotland, and then put down in Cambridge for a while. Um, I've had a bit more of a, a, a kind of portfolio life of uh, working than I suppose a number of doctors have. I think I like to see myself as a as, as a as a as a tr as a trailblazer, a trendsetter. Because nowadays more and more people are saying, well, they're doing other things other than just straightforward going into the same surgery for the rest of their lives. Work. So it's um, and I think it is something that that's where where uh, general practice is going to be with people doing different roles, you know, here and there, if you like, rather than sure. just the one job. That, that's sort of how things seem to be going. But you, your level of knowledge and expertise in this area, and also the level of controversy that you're prepared to broach, is not that of a typical GP. So what was your sort of critical path, if you like, that led you from what many would see the GP as doing as following nice guidelines and protocols, exercising the prescription pad and handing out statins to a somewhat, somewhat contrarian view of that? 
Well, I think it was a gradual process. I mean, when you're at medical school, you just absorb all these millions of facts they throw at you with no real criticism, criticism if you like, yeah, because that, that, that you won't pass your exams if you do that. Yeah. Uh, but I was I was in Scotland in medical school at that time. Scotland had the highest rate of heart disease in the world, probably. Although I think it still glories in that statistic. It's, it's all those tried yeah. miles bars, right? It's well, not anymore. The, the countries that have the highest rates, the, the country with the highest rate of heart disease currently, I believe, is Turkmenistan. Oh, right. <laughs> Only you would know that, that if, you, <laughs> if you want to or not. Uh, in fact, almost all ex-Soviet Union countries are, are in the top of the pops. Yeah. Uh, the rate of heart disease in Scotland under the age of 65 is about a fifth of what it was in the 1980s. Um, of course, that, that's interesting in and of itself, but, it, but I was interested why are we in Scotland dying? Uh, it, we were all told the same thing, oh, our diet's terrible, yeah. and that raises our, our cholesterol level and we all die of heart disease. I happened to have been to France several times and I went to France and I noticed that um, the French eat more saturated fat or fats than we did. So I started looking at it and, and, and thinking, well, the diet part of the diet heart hypothesis doesn't seem to be making sense. Uh, you know, and then, you know, I looked at the other factors that, that they consider important, like blood pressure, cholesterol levels, um, how much um, animal fat, saturated fat, how many people have got diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and um, matched up the, the, I couldn't match up the Scotsmen exactly. It was British men to French because some of the statistics are not available. Yeah. And really, as I, as I like to joke, you couldn't get a cigarette paper between them. Uh, and in fact, you know, find that the French smoked more, for example, apparently took less exercise. Um, Drank et cetera, et cetera. So actually the, the risk factors favoured Scotland over France or Britain over France. And yet the French rate of heart disease was one fifth that of Scotland. Yeah. So, you know, when you come across facts like this, you either go, oh, well, that's just some form of weird. Well, it, 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 it was known as the French paradox. The explanation I was given, it's the French paradox. Maybe it's the red wine. That's what I was told. Yeah, we were all told it was a red wine. And of yeah. course, the thing is, whenever you get a paradox, a paradox means, I think I looked it up one time, a finding which appears uh, contradictory, but actually can be explained through other mechanisms. Yeah. So just by calling it a paradox, what you're basically saying is, well, OK, there's obviously some reason for this. And, and anyone was very happy to find those reasons. If you look at the red wine explanation, it just doesn't work. And in fact, some of the original research that was done on reverse troll or whatever it's called was actually found to be falsified anyway. Yeah. Um, the, the red wine thing is just, it, it's what I call ad hoc hypothesis. If, if you find a contradictory fact, what people have a tendency to do is say, oh, well, why is it contradictory? Oh, here's the explanation. Yeah. And then they, they then go, oh, well, we've now explained that. The French don't get much heart disease. Actually, the explanation I got was they drink red wine they eat lightly cooked vegetables, which protects the antioxidants. <laughs> yeah. And um, oh, what was the other one? Uh, and they did something else as well. But I mean, it, once you started chasing them down, they, were all, they all found to just be something somebody said. You know, a bloke down yeah. the pub said it, yeah. which is the same way as you, you possibly know the five portions of fruit and vegetables are protective. And then you try and find out where that research came from. And it came from nowhere. It, it came never from vegetable reason. market like five a day. It came from the people who want to sell you the stuff, just like yeah. ten thousand steps. Got no basis except for the bloke who wants to sell you a pedometer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's myths. Yeah. Well, it just myths, and you chase them down, and then there's all this: why do women get less heart disease than men when they tend to have higher cholesterol levels yeah. or what low density lipoprotein levels? And then they said, oh, they're protected by their female sex hormones. Yeah. And then when you chase that down, you find there is absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever. There is just, in fact, the evidence such as there is, which suggests that female sex hormones are mildly causative of cardiovascular disease. And yet these things then just hang. Why do women generally get about a third the rate of heart disease of men at the same age? Well, if you look at the risk factors, there's no explanation for this. But, but no one seems to be interested in, in, in you know, once someone said, oh, what's the sex hormones? Everyone goes, oh, it's the sex hormones. And you'll see that written down. And, um, and even when it was disproved, it's still written down. <laughs> it, it is extraordinary, isn't it? Because, you know, we're all taught the fundamentals of science. And yet there are certain things that you dare not question. It's like gravity, right? No one yeah. in the right mind would question the existence of gravity. It just is. 
Yeah. And this whole, and let's, you mentioned the diet heart hypothesis. Just say a bit more about that. Well, it started life, um, well, it started life quite a long time ago, but it kind of um, flamed into fewer pure life in uh, about the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. With, there was one researcher called Ansel Keys from America, the inventor of a thing called key rations, which you might have heard of. He's, he's a very bright guy, obviously, and very yeah, yeah. dynamic, and yeah. just managed to... And sociopathic. Ramp. Oh, and sociopathic. Well, yeah. they usually go hand in hand, unfortunately. Certainty of purpose, should we say? Yeah, uh, and and he he had an idea that um, the thing that raised cholesterol in your bloodstream, which we don't have, was eating too much cholesterol, um, yeah. and that was his original hypothesis. And then he did experiments where he fed cholesterol to people, mainly in the form of egg yolks, and found it made no difference whatsoever to the thing that he measured in the blood that he called cholesterol. And uh, so he, he decided, well, that can't be right because it must be something else. And he just said. Oh, well, it's probably saturated fat. I understand that that was because somebody that he knew was in, is in Italy and post Second World War, there was a lot of rationing, very little meat was eaten and the Italians had a low rate of heart disease. Yeah. So he immediately thought, oh, that's the answer. So he went off, distorted statistics from countries around the world to prove his case yeah. and convinced everybody that saturated fat, whatever he called them, raised cholesterol whatever that was that caused heart disease and and that idea became if you like the central idea that that remains today as strong as it ever was really and it's easy isn't it you know when you look at the bottom of the frying pan you can see the congealed fat and you can just imagine how that congealed fat in your artery will block the artery and cause a heart attack right i mean it's it's in that sense it's a very easy story to to portray Absolutely. I mean, I, I think humans are, 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 are suckers for a good story. Mm. In fact, I think we are overwhelmed when we get someone can tell a good story that we, we go, uh, that, I like that story. It makes sense to me. And I can see it. I can, I can visualize it. And you're right. Even though cholesterol is not fat and fat is not cholesterol. And, and the two things yeah. are, are very loosely correlated substances. But, but the type of food that contains saturated fat tends to be animal and, and it tends to look a bit gooey and people don't like looking at, at fatty things particularly yeah and then someone says well that's the same fatty stuff that ends up in your arteries it's like uh, well it's a simple idea <laughs> yeah. it intuitively it makes sense it's just devoid of any science yeah well there is no science of any part of it it's just lacking in science and once you start looking into what happens to fats when you eat them it, it all just disintegrates very rapidly as, a, as an idea i mean your, your fat fat is just transported directly from your gut straight into your fat cells without having anything to do with the liver without having anything to do with the substance that we call bad cholesterol which is low density lipoprotein the two things are just unconnected yeah and yet you know uh, in fact the only thing that will make fatty levels of fatty stuff in your blood go up for sure and i've known this for years is eating carbohydrates and, and people say, well, how can you eat carbohydrates make your level of fatty things in your blood go up? Say, because your liver converts fatty, well, converts carbohydrate into fat when, when it can't do anything else with it. When I often say to people, why do you think cows have got so much fat in them? They don't eat any fat at all, do they? They eat pure carbohydrates, grass. And what they do in their stomachs is they convert the carbohydrates into fat, fatty acids. So in fact, cows actually eat an almost pure fat diet in, 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 that, in reality. Um, that's what they do. And yet they don't get heart disease, yet they're, they're full of fat. When we eat them full of saturated fat, we're told that's the thing that causes our fat levels in our blood to rise and we get heart disease. I mean, as you say, it, the, the level of scientific thinking here is, is zero. And what's extraordinary is that all of us health professionals, including myself for a larger part of my career, knowing the science that I know, accepted this unquestioningly because it's handed down to you like gravity on a plate. And why would anyone argue it? So we're not going to make the mistake of confusing the technology and talk about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. 
but I would do want to talk about lipids and uh, transport mechanisms because they are part of the story, I think. So let's yeah. kind of discuss this. So I always talk about the liver as a kind of metabolic factory. It produces stuff um, that it's the, it's the kind of factory, m metabolic factory of the body. And the stuff it produces is um, oily. And as you said, the bloodstream is watery. And we know that water and oil don't mix. So you have to find some mechanism to get the oily stuff from the liver in the uh, watery environment of the bloodstream to wherever it needs to go. And those things are called lipoproteins. So let's just have some conversation around that, because I do think um, as the clot and the clot thicken, um, it has a role to play. Yeah, well, it, as you say, fats and cholesterol, two different substances, um, are transported. When you absorb them from your gut, they have to get from the gut to the liver or elsewhere. And they, they tend to go from the, from the gut into the um, straight into the bloodstream. So they're transported in a particularly big form of kind of a big form of lipoprotein. Confusingly, everything's called a different thing. So a very, very big lipoprotein is called a chylomicron. Just why, I suppose somebody called it that in 1832 and the name is yeah. Dr. Simpson. And um, it's and a these, particular lipoprotein. A particular lipoprotein, about, about the size of, say, a basketball. And, and this, so the fats and cholesterol that are absorbed from your bloodstream, uh, absorbed from your gut, go straight into your bloodstream, travel around your body. The kind of micron loses its fats and it's mainly its fats, and then shrinks and shrinks and shrinks down until it becomes the size of about a tennis ball, at which point it's absorbed into the liver and sort of broken down. So that's the main route. And that's the, the route that avoids the liver, if you like, because the liver doesn't have to do anything to cholesterol or fats. It has no, no role in doing anything to them. It, it's quite happy for the rest of the body to get its, its resource straight from the gut. But if you eat, uh, if you eat carbohydrates, on the other hand, they've turned all carbohydrates, like, which is, as you know, bread, rice, pasta, rice krispies, anything that's, that's um, cardboard boxes, um, or rice krispies, much the same thing is that they, they, are, they are digested, broken down into simple sugars, mainly glucose and fructose. And then they go straight from the gut into the liver because the body can't allow an enormous rise in the level of these sugars straight into the bloodstream or else it would cause havoc. So yeah. they're transported directly to the liver. The liver then says, okay, what am I gonna do with them? It can store about, about 500 calories worth. It allows a certain amount into the bloodstream gradually and then cells can take that up if they want and, and store it themselves you can store about 1500 calories of carbohydrate which is about four mars bars or something and after that you're full yeah um, and it's a mixture of that. in the liver and in the muscles yeah it uh, depends how, how um, big your mars bars are how big the person and is and how well, big so. your muscles are that's right so yeah. uh, so a six six power lifting it's, uh, Icelandic would, would store a bit more than a four foot ten uh, small petite woman, obviously, but, but on the basis that we can store a certain amount. So once you've stored that certain amount, uh, the body then, the liver has to go, right, uh, the only thing I can do now is make it into fats, and that's what it does. So it converts glucose, essentially. Fructose goes to glucose, glucose goes to fats, or what they call fatty acids. And these are packed into another form of a lipoprotein called a very low-density lipoprotein, otherwise called a triglyceride. That then comes out of the liver and transports the excess fats around the body. So these VLDLs or very low density lipoproteins or chylomicrons lose their fats as they travel around the body. They shrink down in size as they do that and they become a low density lipoprotein, the thing that people call bad cholesterol, although it's not cholesterol. And at which point the liver takes, removes virtually all of these from the bloodstream. So it's the liver that, that, that removes them. Uh, an interesting fact I was told a couple of years ago is people who have a thing called familiar hypercholesterolemia, where they've got millions of LDL molecules, and, and some people have got extraordinarily high levels, which is damaging, because you're talking about levels of 50 or 60, which is 20 or 30 times what the normal level should be. If these people get a liver transplant, their LDL their level, their light protein level, the bad cholesterol level, goes back to normal like that. So it's a liver that controls this, these levels of everything. It is the master controller, and it and it and it it makes sure that everything is done properly. So just just to say again, the chylomicron, the big big lipoprotein, takes fats from the gut, 
distribute some around the body. Little remnants are left to absorb back into the liver. But just, if you eat carbohydrates and you, you have nowhere left to store them, the liver makes them in, turns them into fat, turn, puts them into a VLDL that transports them around the body, losing fat until it shrinks down into a low density lipoprotein. And, and that is then removed from the circulation generally. And it's, it's that one that everyone says is, is the bad one. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk at all or say what, what the thing that we call good cholesterol is. Um, or not. Well, I, I, to, I, this is complicated stuff, isn't it? Because you've got this stuff being transported around the body in, in, in lipoproteins. And the way that I imagine it, and I don't know if it's helpful, I kind of describe it in two ways. One is if you imagine that you've got submarines and they dock at the liver, they take on the cargo, um, and, they, and depending on, they take on the specific cargo and they go around the body, drop it off and come back to the liver and they're recycled. Um, the other way I kind of imagine it is if a balloon, so you fill the balloon with whatever the contents might be. And as it goes round, the balloon becomes emptier and emptier and emptier, discharges its cargo, it then comes back to the liver, it's completely recycled and off it goes again. So it's just a yeah. kind of way for people to imagine this without it becoming too scientific. Yeah, I think, I think the, the balloon's probably better because some balloons don't get bigger and smaller, but- um, Exactly. Um, um, so I, you can see your problem with it. Allergies always have a, only worked so far, but yeah, I mean, yeah. it is essentially, it's a, it's a cargo vessel, but in this case, the cargo vessel gets bigger and then gets smaller. It picks up its load, gets rid of it, comes back again. That's that's what their function is. Yeah, is to take these things that can't be can't be dissolved in water and allow them to be transported around the body to to where they're needed. That's yeah. that's that's why they exist. So, I think generally it's accepted now that. There's more to all of this, even by the orthodoxy, that there's a bit more to all of this than saturated fat. But if you're going to carry on with this kind of diet heart hypothesis, you have to keep iterating it, don't you? Because as you knock it down, either you abandon the hypothesis or you find some other way of alternative way of explaining it. And the current vogue has got to do with LDL, low density lipoprotein, um, which people call bad cholesterol, but you know, it isn't actually cholesterol, although it contains some. So the theory goes that it's the LDL that causes the problem, and that's the statins correct the LDL and solve the problem. Um, so let's talk a bit about that, because I, I've, I'd always struggled to understand how LDLs could be the cause of the problem and end up in arterial walls. But you've kind of explained it in such a fundamentally comprehensible way that makes you realise actually it was a ludicrous idea in the first place. So let's describe what they're saying happens, and then let's go on to say actually why scientifically this isn't just unlikely; it's completely impossible. Impossible. No. Well, the, the hypothesis is obviously if you have more LDLs, so you've got raised LDL numbers of molecules in your bloodstream, that they will. Um, travel through the lining of the art. All blood vessels are lined by, by a single cell layer called an endothelial cell. Anyway, that, that they transported through this cell into the artery wall behind and gradually build up into thickenings, a bit like you said, you look at um, you can look at thickenings in pipes or something where 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 fat and fat bergs are created. So so essentially what you're seeing is basically LDL just being deposited in the walls of blood vessels. These are the thickenings that they call atherosclerotic plaques or atherosclerosis. These thickenings gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually they become a sort of vulnerable point where a blood clot, large blood clot forms that blocks the entire blood vessel and causes a heart attack or a stroke. That is the, that is it. That is the hypothesis, I think. And, and on just like the fat in the bottom of the frying pan, on the face of it, that seems it's reasonable and plausible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And there's a certain amount of circumstantial evidence that if you look at it from the right direction, standing on one leg makes some sense. But it's simply impossible. And, and you're going to explain, as you do so elegantly in the book, you're going to explain why it's impossible. In, in under 30 seconds. <laughs> well, the cells that line all your blood vessels, the endothelial cells, are just like any other cell. They carefully control what gets into them and what gets out of them. Cells can control the passage of 
single atoms. So you'll, you'll have heard of your medics and physiologists and whatever have heard of things like calcium channels or sodium channels and potassium channels. And these are basically things that allow single ions, which are charged atoms, to move in and out of the cell. You can't get them in and out unless the cell wants them in there or out of there. And it will pump things out and suck things in, depending on what its needs are. And uh, LDL themselves, you can't get an LDL into a cell unless the cell wants it to be in. So it, it, in order to, to facilitate this, it, it creates an LDL receptor, which we think of as maybe like, a, I don't know, an egg cup. It takes the egg cup, shoves it out the side of the cell into the bloodstream, a passing LDL molecule is attracted to the egg cup because, because the LDL has got a protein on it that is attracted. So there's a lock and key mechanism, if you like. There's a mechanism that recognizes it. So the LDL receptor and the LDL molecule lock onto each other. And they are then both, the whole thing is pulled back into the cell. The LDL molecule itself is then broken down and the cell uses the cholesterol and the fatty acids and whatever is within it for the purposes that it so requires. At that point, normally the LDL receptor itself is broken down as well, so it no longer exists. So we, so we therefore know that the only way you can get an LDL into a cell is if the cell wants it in and creates an LDL receptor for it. The idea that a concentration gradient builds up in some way and that forces LDL into a cell is incomprehensibly stupid. Physiology says that can't happen. It can't happen. There isn't a concentration gradient issue here. Yes, if you raise the level of something astronomically high in the bloodstream, like your sodium level, you can cause the cell to, to basically blow up through osmotic pressure. But I mean, other, other than that, the cells will control it. But the hypothesis currently is that the LDL is plucked from the bloodstream with the receptor. The LDL molecule then separates from the LDL receptor, travels through the cell, arrives at the other side of the cell. And this would be approximately the journey for a human being of walking half a mile on basic scale. It then arrives at the other side of the cell and the cell does what? Creates an inside out LDL receptor, locks onto the LDL and pops it out the other side. Well, these mechanisms, mechanisms of transporting things across cells do exist, but not for LDL, they certainly don't. Yeah. It's highly complicated. It's a controlled structure. And we already know that, for instance, in your brain, that the brain cannot transport LDL from the bloodstream into the brain because there's a barrier function in the brain that stops this happening. For a very good barrier reason. Function yeah. Is the MDL cells because yeah. the brain doesn't want stuff getting into it. It doesn't want it because it's very vulnerable. So, so that approach doesn't work. The next approach is to say, oh, well, the LDL sneaks between the cells. And you go, right, well, that if you don't understand anything about cells, then you can let's invent that. Just, just to break off, because this is quite complicated. Um, so there's a principle, and this is a principle applied to all living things, all, all cells, even single primitive single cellular organisms. And that is that of homeostasis. And that is the incredibly tight control of the internal environment of the cell. So you have a cell membrane and nothing gets in, in normal circumstances, without the express permission of the cell through a receptor. There's a mechanism that allows stuff in and a mechanism that allows stuff out. And once you're inside the cell, you don't just sort of float around doing things at will. The cell controls what goes on and it will generally dismantle anything that comes in, use it up and recycle it. So the idea here is that these LDLs are, you know, these bad damaged LDLs are floating around in the bloodstream. They kind of barge their way into a cell, no mechanism to that. And then they somehow make their way across the river Nile to the other side and emerge at the other side intact and do some damage on the other side of the riverbank. Which if you think, again, if you think about it in a very lay way, you could kind of envision it. But when you understand the fundamental science of cell biology, you realise there simply is no mechanism for stuff to just meander into cells, wander intact across the cell and end up in the cell, opposite cell wall to cause damage. None of the mechanisms exist. And if they did, we'd be dead. Yes, well, we would be dead because if we can't control I mean, that's the function of life is the homeostasis control of your internal milieu is the word. If yeah. cells lose control of their internal milieu, we know what happens. They die. That is 
that is what happens. It's almost the definition of death. You lose control of what is going on within your own cell. And cells are, you know, they're not as big as us, obviously. They're minute, but they still are incredibly complicated. Yeah. Almost organisms, if you like. I mean, the so cells we, that make up your, your, the lining of your blood vessels are almost identical to what they call white blood cells, which are things that can actually crawl about inside your body and move around. So, so they're very, very, they're one step away from a, from a, from an amoeba. If you yeah. <laughs> so they're very, so, very, very complex organisms. So I stopped you at the point where we were saying, okay, we accept that there's no LDL receptor that enables something to go into the cell swim through the cell and swim out and pop out the other side and do damage uh, and therefore okay we're going to just say yeah well, all right so uh, we'll have a narrow go at this what we'll say is it it goes down the gaps between the cells and i stopped yeah. you at that point so that that also doesn't fly and, and again you're you're about to explain why oh, yeah, well, well cells again they, they have to control very carefully what gets between them because again if they didn't allow if they didn't control that then everything could just move in and around all the tissues of the body and once again, uh, essentially, your body would just burst. Um, it, it, it is complicated stuff going on inside there. So yeah. in order to stop this happening, cells are linked together by what they call protein bridges, like really complicated. It's like filaments of protein that link together, then cross over and then hold in. It's like having a zip and, and buttons and Velcro and then someone cements it together as well, just to make sure it's absolutely cemented together. Because it's a requirement for life to have these barriers between the cells. So nothing can go, we, and this is known. I mean, there are journals called tissue barriers. There is a journal called Tissue Barriers, which describes tissue barriers and cell membrane barriers. So this is not like just, oh, I've just made this up. And you can yeah. see them, you can see them under a microscope. You can see there is no way for anything to travel between the cells either. You know, cells are essentially terraced houses. They are yeah. locked together. They may be separate houses, but if you looked at them from the outside, you wouldn't know where they join together. They are locked together and um, and they have to be. And that's how the life exists, in fact. Um, it, it allows the control, not only of the internal cell environment, the milieu, the homeostasis, but also the environment between say the bloodstream and all the tissues behind it, which have to be protected. So it's this is just basic physiology, which is none of this is not accepted. I'm not saying anything here that anyone could argue with yep. at all. Anyone who even O level biology would tell you this much, right? Maybe, maybe A level. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is pretty much it's like, you know, it's a bit like saying we've got bones inside our body. I know you can't see them, but they're there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it is basic stuff, um, which just seems to have been completely ignored, uh, essentially. So we've explained that there's no such thing as good cholesterol and bad cholesterol and why that is. And we've kind of, dis I mean, there's much more in the book. I would encourage people to read the book because you, you explain it so well and, and there's a limit to how much detail we can go into in a, in a podcast. But I think we've probably given people enough to make them question this whole LDL thing because when you explain it in the way that you just have, it, it makes no sense. So we've kind of talked about what doesn't happen. And I'd kind of, what I'd like to do now is explore what does happen because cardiovascular disease exists. It's still the major killer. Um, it, it's a huge concern and something drives it. So let's now talk through a plausible mechanism of the cause of cardiovascular disease. Right. Well, it's been 35 years of... Of, of, of diving down rabbit holes and getting lost in variously complicated places because it, it is um, complicated. It, well, it's complicated in one way. There's lots of complications. It's a bit like saying E equals MC squared. There you are. And yeah. then going, right, well, there's quite a lot behind that, actually. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's, it's a kind of a very simple idea. But essentially, what you're looking at in, uh, in, in the, in the, in this world is, and it's not a new hypothesis, it's been around for 170 years, is that the, the arteries and the arteries specifically, because remember you never get atherosclerosis in veins, even though they have the same LDL level, etc. So it's only in larger arteries we're talking about. So essentially 
um, what happens is that the, the, the lining of the artery, which is, as I've said before, these endothelial cells, they become damaged. Now they're either stripped off or they just become damaged. That triggers a blood clot to form at that point. Not necessarily a very big clot, blood clot. It might be so small you might only see it under a microscope, for example. But anyway, a blood clot forms because it's triggered by one, once you've exposed the underlying artery to the bloodstream, that is a very powerful clarion call for blood clotting. We know this. Again, this is just this is sort of clot physiology 101. So as blood clot yeah. forms on top of that area. Now, obviously, it can't just keep getting bigger and bigger. Otherwise, every time a blood clot formed, you'd have a heart attack or a stroke. So it stops forming almost as quickly as it starts. But you're still left with a problem. You have a blood clot stuck to the artery. What? What do you do with it? Um, well, you can't just let it break off and travel further down the artery because you're going to get a heart attack or a stroke further down and, and a problems will occur. So it has to be dealt with at that point. Now, you know, if you scratch your skin, you'll get some bleeding or if you scrape your skin, you'll get some bleeding and then a clot will form on top of the skin. But actually what happens to the skin is that the tissue, the skin cells grow up from underneath because they can and they push the clot off and eventually the scab is gone and a new layer of skin appears underneath. Yeah, so, so that, that, basically the body repairs itself. You get the clot yeah. underneath the body repairs itself. And when well, in this case, no, and this in, 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 in on your skin, yes, yeah. that happens. And then the and clot falls happen. away and you've then got a perfect piece of skin. So you don't even, yeah. you know, in most cases you won't even see a scar. Yes. There's a slightly different mechanism in the endothelial system though. That's right. Well, because partly because you don't have any cells underneath to grow up. There's only one layer of cells and nothing else. Also, if the cells grew up from underneath and pushed the blood clot off, it would just travel down the, the blood vessel to a point where it narrowed enough that it would block it. Yeah. So it can't do these things, so it has to have a different process. And what the process is, is that it covers up the re remaining blood clot with a, a new layer of these cells, which are called well, the endothelial cells. And then effectively, you've got a new layer on top of the blood clot which means that the blood clot is now lying within your within your it's kind of walled clot. in so it's it the damage yeah. is contained and new cells grow the other side of it so it's kind of walled into the wall now yes that's right and and then in most cases for most people it will be broken down by white blood cells that come into the area and attack it and eat it and get rid of it so in the um, end it, something walls it in then over time it's gradually eaten away absorbed yes so that's the fate, I would imagine, of 99.999% of, of blood clots that, that happen. Yeah. So the repair systems are, are there and they work very well. Yeah. So the question is, well, why, why does it then, why do they then start to grow? Up? Well, the answer is that you create um, that, that point. There's a slight area of weakness. And if, if you've got other things that damage the artery wall at that point again and again, you get repeated episodes at that point and if that happens rapidly enough the repair systems start to become overwhelmed and actually instead of the all of the junk being got rid of this this plaque which is remnant blood clots starts to grow and grow and eventually you have quite a major thickening at that point and that is the basis of an atherosclerotic plaque which is the narrowing and the, the gunk and of course the well, you might say, well, I thought you said it was all full of fatty stuff and whatever. Well, when you look at what's actually in a, a plaque, it is, um, it contains all the things that were originally can be found in a blood clot. So something has caused damage to the lining of the cell wall. Yeah. And that produces, that ends up in a clot. And if all goes well, it basically repairs itself and gets absorbed. So yeah. what is so the next qu obvious question then is what is causing the damage in the first place? Well, there's the thing is that is to look at there's no one thing that causes damage, and this is where I just said you don't look at causes, you look at process, and then ask what can trigger the process. So I, I use a, an analogy, I don't know if it's a great analogy of them. Um, uh, a car, the paintwork on a car generally doesn't rust until you scratch it. It's not true of all cars, but um, nowadays it increasingly is. So until you damage the paintwork. The, the water doesn't get at the underlying metal, the, the, the salt doesn't get at the underlying metal, so you don't get any rust. rust. You can't rust. So you have to first damage, do cause damage. So what things can damage a car, paintwork? Well, you, you know, most people could probably think of 100 off the top of their heads. 
you know, a stone flies up, another car bashes into it, you hit a pillar of, at the side of the road, um, you know, you run a, a shopping trolley into it, the key from your, you, you use a key and it scratches it, or whatever, you know, or, or as I use the analogy. Multiple things can erode the... Multiple things can cause the original damage. Yeah. So you've got to look and say, well, what sort of things do we know can cause damage? What things have been found to cause damage? Well, for instance, smoking is smoking. If you smoke, small particles get into your lungs. A, a number of them escape, called nanoparticles, escape into your bloodstream. They are particularly toxic to endothelial cells, and they cause them to die. And in fact, you can measure dead remnants of dead um, endothelial cells after a healthy volunteer smokes one cigarette. Yeah. And you think, oh, well, that's not very good. So clearly, at the same time, obviously, the repair systems actually are fired up. So new endothelial cells or endothelial progenitor cells are produced at the same time. So as you cause the damage, the mechanism for repair is also swinging into action. But obviously, there comes a point if you smoke 80 cigarettes or 100 cigarettes a day, you know, and you're, you've been doing that for 20 years. I think your repair systems are just to give us a break. Yeah. You know, just well. like if you keep scratching the car and you never repair the paintwork, eventually yeah. the rust sets into the point where um, end, end yeah. car. I've, I've yeah. got this image because I remember listening to you on a podcast uh, talking about an Alpha Sud and people oh, yeah. used to wake up in the morning. They had a car when they left, when they went to bed. When they, when they woke up in the morning, there was just a pile of rust where the car <laughs> used to be. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, Italian cars in the 1980s didn't yeah. do very well in Scotland. They tended to dissolve. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the sharp tinkling sound as they, as they I believe the uh, Lancia Beta or something was the worst of them all but, um, but in general yeah. yes no, we, you, need, you, you need to damage and I think that they, you know, the damage analogy I sometimes use potholes in the road you know that, that roads are bashed by car tires and ice and rain and whatever and um, and if, if the council spend a lot of money repairing them you're fine but once they start running out of money, potholes appear and they get bigger and bigger until eventually you've just got bloody great potholes. And of course, the body's not as simplistic as that, but we are running into the same system, which is if the damage just is, is overwhelming or working faster than the repair, you've got a problem. Yeah. If the repair can, systems are working faster than damage, you're probably fine. And, and so you've got to look at both ends of it. So if you look at the, the repair systems and keeping them in good nick, that's a good thing. Of course, the other thing that can cause a problem is if you you have a particular propensity to produce big, sticky, difficult to get rid of blood clots, which, which some people do. So there's kind of three stage process. You damage the artery wall, the blood clot forms, the repair systems come in. That's all normal, if you like, although the yeah. damage bit you're trying to reduce. Um, so you're looking at things that increase the rate of damage, things that make your blood clots more bigger and more difficult to get rid of, and things that interfere with the repair system sometimes one thing can do all three simultaneously generally things do one of the three sometimes two of the three and so you start looking at various things and say well does that we know that increases the risk of heart disease what's it doing if you like so you could look at i say smoking is quite easy diabetes is another one we know which is a major problem and you say well why does diabetes cause the same problem well we now know that a raised blood sugar level attacks the, the, the protective lining that's on all endothelial cells, it's called, it's the same stuff that protects fish. It's called glycocalyx, it's the slippery stuff. Yeah. And if that is strong and healthy and repels all borders, your endothelial cells are less likely to get damaged. What diabetes and blood sugar does is it strips this level, thins it down and makes damage more likely. So we can see diabetes, yep, smoking, yep. You know, and just to slip in something um, up to date, COVID-19 virus. Yeah. What does the COVID-19 virus do? Well, it gets inside cells because it hijacks the receptor mechanisms. That's what then viruses do. Yeah. That's yeah. what all viruses do that can get into your cells. Then multiplies inside your cells. The cells it tends to get into are endothelial cells because they have the particular receptor that it, that it locks onto. Then the virus is within the cells. It's damaging the cells. The immune system starts attacking those cells because they have become the enemy. And you get blood clots throughout the vascular system and and this is quite often what is the if people have severe infection this is the thing that quite often actually kills people with covid so i mean other viruses have done this too influenza does it and with bacteria infection if you know people have now linked periodontal disease yeah. to cardiovascular disease to chronic gum infection you think well how can a chronic gum infection give you heart disease 
It's the yeah. same process as the, the bacteria in your gum are re releasing what they call exotoxins into your bloodstream. These exotoxins are particularly nasty to your endothelial cells. They cause damage to your endothelial cells. As they die, the blood clots form, the cardiovascular disease is accelerated. So you can look at something like smoking and periodontal disease. Of course, the cholesterol hypothesis has nothing to say on any of these things because it has nothing to do with them. How are they linked together? And that was the linking together that was the thing that I spent a lot of time trying to work out. So you can look at something like cocaine use, which is now known to be- That's a great example, yeah. yeah. And um, cocaine, well, as we know, it destroys the 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 between the the, the, the I forgot the name of the thing between your nose the septum yeah. the septum that's right yeah. your, your septum is destroyed and falls out but that's because it it actually cocaine causes enormous endothelial local endothelial damage it blocks all the blood vessels causes them to clot and causes the center of your nose to fall out so that should give you a clue of what cocaine is doing to the rest of the cardiovascular system it's really damaging to your endothelium. And it, and it triggers, I mean, a lot of people that in the acute phase after having taken cocaine, I think you're something like in that hour, 60 times more likely to have a heart attack than at other times. It's really quite brutal stuff. So essentially it, it became relatively straightforward. It almost became a game. It's like, well, I know this causes heart disease. Some things are associated with heart disease. How does it do it? Does it damage the endothelium? Yes, it does. Does it cause increased sizes of blood clots to form? Yes, it does. You know, does it interfere with the repair system? And so you, you can bring things in that appear utterly unconnected on the face of it. Yeah. And then you find they are connected. They're connected to this process at the center of it, which is some people have called the thrombogenic hypothesis. Thrombo meaning blood and blood clotting sort of. Yeah. And genic meaning the genesis of. Yeah. The thrombogenic hypothesis has been around for a long time. But, but people haven't sort of brought it together maybe quite in this way uh, although I was taught by um, uh, um, a, a researcher and cardiologist at Aberdeen Elspeth Smith who was the first person to say me LDL cannot get through the endothelium uh, in a small group session uh, I had no idea what LDL was and I didn't know what the endothelium was but it sounded kind of important so I thought yeah. I thought I'd better why not what is she talking about because it just dinged something in my brain mm. Uh, she was quite right. And in fact, she, she, she did a lot of research and wrote very widely saying that basically blood clotting is involved in the very start of heart disease and the creation of the atherosclerotic plaque to its growth, its development and the final event, which is the, the final blood clot. And, and, and so, so she kind of worked out the process, but somehow or other, well, not somehow or other, at that time that, that, that the statins were coming big time yeah. and anyone who had a different idea was just basically squashed. Yeah. So, um, so you know, these ideas, and, and then I've said to other people, or the medics, I said, there is nothing here that contradicts what you know, apart from the first bit. Because the medical profession is quite happy to accept that blood clots forming on already existing plaques, so a blood clot can form in a plaque, not necessarily big enough to block the entire blood vessel. And then you can see the sudden growth of the size of the, clot, of the plaque. You know, people who've been scanned over years, you know, the, blood, the, the plaque just stays at a certain size and then all of a sudden it's bigger. Next time you look, it doesn't just gradually enlarge, it jumps. So that jump is the progression of, of the blood clot forming. So that's accepted. It's also accepted the final event in heart disease is a blood clot. I mean, almost everything we do in heart disease, you know, once someone's had a heart attack, we get rid of the clot, we put in a stent, we pull the clot out, we give anticoagulants, we give long-term anticoagulants. So, so the association of blood clotting and heart disease is not exactly... No, that's um, not, it's not controversial, is it? It's, it's just yeah. the mechanism. Well, it's, it's the initial mechanism. Initia the oh, initial mechanism. Yeah, yeah. The initial mechanism is exactly the same. It's yeah. a blood clot forming in the artery wall. Yeah. And, and, and that's what's triggered. That's what starts it. That's what makes it grow. And that's what finishes it. It's the same process all the way through. Whereas they're saying, no, it's LDL that diffuses into the artery wall to start with. And then everything else happens. And so what well, you've got, why not have, you know, to an extent, why have two processes when you can have just one, you know? Occam's razor, isn't it? Um, Occam's razor, yeah. And hypertension. Yeah. Well, blood pressure, raised blood pressure, uh, clearly, you know, you, you ask yourself the question why, or I ask myself the question, why do plaques never form in veins? 
thing because the blood pressure is very low in veins. And if you take a vein from the leg and stick it into the heart as a coronary bypass vessel, which is a fairly common operation, um, it, it very often will very rapidly develop atherosclerosis. Do you say, well, what's happened to that vein? Well, the only thing that's happened is it's been put in a place with higher blood pressure. There's nothing else that's happened to it. It's not exposed to anything else. It's exactly the same. It's come from the same person. Yeah. In the leg, no atherosclerosis. Stick it in the heart, lots of atherosclerosis. Right? And the lungs have their own blood system or circulatory system. Blood comes into the right-hand side of your heart. It's pumped out of the right-hand side of your heart into your lungs. And then goes from your lungs into your left-hand side of your heart where it goes around the rest of your body. You don't get plaques in your lungs either. You can, but it's very rare. But only when the blood pressure is raised quite significantly in the lungs, pulmonary hypertension. Yeah. And the blood pressure in your lungs is normally about 20 over 8, whereas in the rest of your blood system, it's about 120 over 80. So it's yeah. way down as a tenth, you know, it's like a fifth or tenth. And, and so it's clear that the, 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 the blood pressure, as it gets higher, is causing greater stress on your, your your endothelial cells by definition, and particularly at the points where the, the blood vessels branch, because at these branch points you get turbulence. Turbulence. So I, I just have a book I liken it to white water, sort of cascading down down a mountain river, uh, and and putting and turning boulders over with the force as it goes by. Whereas once you get down to veins, it's like you know the, it's like in a in a plane at the bottom of the, you know, where the gently the, the floating stream, delta plane, the, the streams are meandering gently, so there's hardly any pressure on it. So they said that's a so raised blood pressure at high levels is a risk factor for an increased risk of heart disease. That's that that is of course, I think, relatively inarguable. It's not maybe as a huge risk as you'd imagine, but it's definitely there. So yes, hypertension is a risk factor, and you can see how that links, linking in the same way. And it explains to an extent why you see plaques in certain places. You know, why do you most commonly get plaques in your heart, for example, the arteries in your heart? Because your heart is beating continuously, yeah. 70 times a minute. And as you can imagine, the blood vessels on it are getting squashed and squished and mangled back and forward. In fact, they're squeezed shut when the heart, when the heart contracts, there's such a pressure on the vessels, they're squeezed closed. Yeah. So that you get no circulation in the heart when the heart's contracting. It's when the heart relaxes that the blood actually can circulate in the heart. And when the, so as the rest of the body is getting, as it contracts, that's when they get the circulation. But in the heart, actually, when it relaxes, is when the circulation occurs, because the blood vessels are under such mechanical stress all the time. And the other common place to get uh, plaque is in the neck, as it's called the carotid arteries. And this is another place where the blood pressure is coming straight up the heart. It's very high. Yeah. And you can get quite nasty plaques here. And the plaque can break off and travel. In this case, can plaque up, break off. Sometimes you get a clot, breaks off and travels into your brain. So you can see again, how, well, I think you can see how blood pressure relates to smoking, relates to diabetes, relates to you know periodontal disease, and on and on and on. So it's, it, it, it's almost like very intellectually satisfying. And you say, oh, I can see how these... I There's think a bit of a nurse, I'm, how they all fit together. Yeah. I'm sensing a bit of a theme here. So we've kind of given lots of examples, and I guess we could play this where you could, I'd run out of ideas, but you could probably play this game all night, which is to name yet another cause and explain it by the same mechanism. Yeah. Um, but I think we've made the principle. Are there any other really major causes? I mean, there's lots of other examples you give in the book, but do you think we've done sufficient on, on that for now? Well, I think the, the other one that obviously I covered and my big thing was what we call stress or psychological stress or psychological upset. Um, and I think the, the, that's, a more, that's a less absolutely direct route. But if you are chronically stressed and your stress system, your stress hormones, your, what they call the sympathetic system, are constantly on alert. This does several things. It releases stress hormones, which cause your blood vessels to contract. It raises your blood pressure. The stress hormones themselves interfere with repair systems in your body. Um, drugs like uh, hormones like cortisol that are part of your stress system are actually directly antagonistic to, to insulin. And so they raise your blood sugar levels and et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a, the, and your blood is more ready to clot. 
So yeah. with yeah. psychological stress or chronic psychological stress, you've got increased endothelial damage, increased blood clots or blood clots that form, form more readily, more difficult to get rid of, and your repair systems are hampered or reduced. So, so people who are chronically stressed, depression, anxiety, yeah. some of the significant mental disorders such as schizophrenia. Yeah. I mean, the, the average age of death with schizophrenia is 48. Yeah. And, and, and primarily due to cardiovascular disease. And they, they often develop diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So you, they have a significant cardiometabolic. Cardio so I think that, that, um, that that's, that's the other, in my view, the other biggie, if you like, is, is, is the psychosocial, psychological stress, whatever you call it. That, and it causes other forms of damage as well, but this, this is really important. So I've got two more questions, really. Um, the first of which is, if LDL isn't the cause, there's not a whole lot of point in measuring my LDL to know what my cardiovascular risk factors are. So in the best of all possible worlds, what are the things we should be measuring that tell us we are at elevated risk or at reduced risk? Well, um, uh, getting into a bigger area. I mean, I think um, what I tend to say to people is that the, the factors that we've measured for the last 50 years are relatively unchanged, aren't they? If you went to a GP in 1970 and you went to a GP now, they'd be telling you exactly the same things, I think. Yeah. Slightly more emphasis on cholesterol than there was in those days. But I mean, the things that you need to look at now, you can't get most of these things done in, in the UK general practice or, and, or otherwise. Yeah. But you can actually, you can measure central blood pressure, which is the more important blood pressure, the pressure at your heart rather than the pressure at your arm, which gives you a more accurate representation of what's actually going on. These, these monitors cost about £3,000 and you, can, you wouldn't, I wouldn't advise buying one for yourself, but you can go to someone who can measure that. Don't try this at home, yeah. Don't try this at home. The other thing that is coming in is you can measure, I know this is slightly top end stuff, but you can measure your, your actual, the, the protective layer of your endothelium, the glycocalyx by sticking a, monitor, a microscope under the tongue and seeing what's happening to your small blood vessels in your body. That is important. That again and, and is not. It, it looks under the tongue at the microvasculature. Yes. And that is a sufficient proxy to know what's going on. You can extrapolate that into other parts of the body. Yeah, we well, can exactly extrapolate. It's actually used also to monitor sepsis, you know, when you get bacterial infection. And you can see this lining being stripped off and, and you measure it. You can tell virtually whether someone's going to live or die dependent on the amount of endothelial glycogen calyx damage so this is a this is, is a new area but it's very interesting um i would tend to measure what happens to your blood sugar levels after you eat so i'd get some blood sugar monitoring done because some people whilst you don't have diabetes your blood sugar level can be going up very high when you don't even know it yeah. so you, you can get these ambulatory monitoring kits now and i think they're they are if you like a thing of the the now that is going to become absolutely standard yeah and, and um, uh, you know, when people are unaware of the fact that on the blood sugar, when they measure it, it might be okay, there's periods when it's going through the roof. Yeah. And if you can avoid that, then I think that's a very important thing to to achieve. And there are, there are more, I mean, your, your general things like, yes, just get your general blood pressure checked. Yes, absolutely. If it's through the roof, have a look at it, ask yourself why on earth it's going on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tending to look beyond that. You know, if you go to your GP, you'll get things done which are of some benefit. Apart from your, I mean, are... in GP land, they don't measure your LDL anyway. Yeah, they actually measure something else, which is your total cholesterol level divided by your good cholesterol level. And, and of course, why that's interesting is that's actually a measure of insulin resistance or diabetes. The HDL strikes. It. it, it, it it's worth measuring that what they call dyslipidemia definitely so um those things are are, are valid um to do um your ldl won't be measured so you don't need to worry about that um if you go to your gp they'll do things like you know family history and blah 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 which are of some relevance to you so that you can get a baseline from going just your own doc doctor will be doing these things for you you can go onto the internet this thing called q risk three which is actually the tool that is used to measure and decide what is your cardiovascular risk. And it, it's, 
it's okay in so far as it goes. But you know, I keep getting people writing to me saying, "Well, I have this, and I have no problems on my. I've had a heart attack, and my." Well, the other thing you can measure is 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 the, is the calcium score in your arteries in your heart. Well, I, I've I just, show you one of the um, people who uh, written favourable introductions to your book is a cardiologist, a cardiologist called Scott Murray. Yeah. And um, a few weeks ago, I made the pilgrimage to see Scott. Yeah. And he to have a coronary artery calcium because my lipids are a bit wacky, right? Yeah. So I know, you know, although I'm pretty careful and pretty healthy now, for many years I never exercised. I, I didn't sleep very well. I was highly stressed. I ate the wrong things. How much damage has been done? And according to QRISC3, which is the NHS scale that you're talking about, um, my risk in the next 10 years of a heart attack is something over 10%. Yeah. And do not pass go, do not collect 200 pounds, go straight to your GP for a statin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to Scott and lo and behold, to my delight and surprise, my coronary artery calcium is three and three <laughs> is effectively zero. Well, effectively zero, yeah. Right. So I've got no calcification of my arteries. And we should explain the calcification doesn't kill you. What the calcification shows is that repair, historical repair has been done. Yes. If there's no damage. There's no repair. So if there's been lots of damage, there'll be lots of repair. So the higher your calcification is, the more repair has been done over time, the more damage has been done over time. And this is a far, far higher and more accurate risk predictor than the Q risk. Yeah. And there's another risk predictor called MISA. Yeah. And so when we ran my score through MISA, it brings my score down from 10 point something percent to 4 point something percent um, and no indication for a statin at all. Yeah. And the point about that for me is if everyone uh, and the CAC score, it's not like it's a wild or wacky, uh, expensive test. It's actually a very easy test to do. and It's really cheap. Yeah. If it within the NHS, if GPs could, if, if GPs knew about the CAC score and had the ability to order a CAC score, then a very large number of people who've been completely over over treated with drugs that they don't need, which probably do more harm than good, wouldn't be. And a yes. small number of people who really need a lot of treatment would that would free up the resources to really intervene in those people who really need it. Yeah, it's I know, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I've had I have had discussion with Scott and, and in fact, Ivor Cummings in Ireland um, about the CAC score, and I've always been um, warning people about it in that. You have to know what it is that's going wrong, if you like. <laughs> you also have to be able to do something about it. Correct. Um, and, and I said it it's, is historical, a, and, yeah. and it, it would be nice to get something that would give you real time information rather than historical information. Sure. But having said yeah. that, it's more accurate than, yeah, as you say, if, the, if you have zero score, it doesn't matter what you've been doing, it ain't been doing you any harm. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and if you think you've been doing everything right, your score is through the roof, then you have to ask yourself, what, what, what am I not? actually picking well, up you know, what, what should i be doing that i'm not yeah. and i think that's it as you say as you rightly say that's important in and of itself it, it, it helps to, to to move people more accurately towards towards doing things correct yeah absolutely um because you know if your repair system is fantastic you can probably get away with stuff or equally there may be things going on that you just know to no idea about that are sitting there in the background you may have a blood clotting problem that you didn't even know you had yeah. And in fact, the only time sometimes people know they've got one is is uh, when they have a heart attack and then no one knows why. So it's, yeah, you, you, you know, individualization is good. But if you say, if in your case, your cat score is three, you can almost say, whoopee, carry on. You know, if, you, if your cat score is 3,000, you go, uh, okay. <laughs> I need to do something. Things have been going wrong for years. Yeah. So it's important, I think. Yeah. I, I kind of diverted a bit when you got to CAT because it's a personal hobby horse of mine. No, no, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, well, there's so many. I, I find out I have to be very careful. I, I can go rushing down areas of minute concerns of the population and get all excited about them. And, and did you realize that you know, homocysteine and blah, blah, blah? Um, you know, the, the, these things are there because they are very interesting. You know, I, I went off down the, 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 the sickle cell disease route at one time, which affects virtually no one in this country but is enormously important if you've got it for causing cardiovascular disease. It increases your risk by 
in one study, 50,000%. And when I see a figure like that, I get all excited and go, oh, what's, what's going on here? You know, so it, 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 you know, you have to try and bring it back to what is helpful for people as well. You know, it's all very well theory and whatever. Um, I like to think I've pointed out to people from, if you like reading this, at least hopefully you can go away and have a much better idea about stuff you should be looking at, the stuff you should be concerned about, you know, that no one is really telling people about. Which is which is the worrying thing, isn't it? The statins, statins, all the bloody, uh, all the bloody way, you know. And 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 um, uh, this is not now basic SK nine inhibitors. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, the latest one, PCSK nine. Don't ask me what it stands for. I know what it does, but I can never remember. Polycrinolid something. Anyway, that, that's the thing that breaks down the LDL receptor once it's taken in the LDL is a PCSK nine enzyme. Yeah. If you block that enzyme, then the, the, the receptor is then free to go back to the surface of the cell and bring more LDL in. So it kind of brings LDL in at a much higher rate. So the level in your blood drops, to which I used to have said to people, well, that, well the cholesterol is bad for you. Why would you want your cells to be being filled up with cholesterol? Surely this would be a bad thing. Um, but of course, logic has gone from this world, but there we are. Um, you know, PCSK9 inhibitors will be found to have... The, the, the early the, the result on them are that, that they did nothing for cardiovascular disease death or death <laughs> but or death. Well, it's, like the, it's like the it's like the increased death which is probably not what you want from a drug is it I mean no. not hugely but, but I mean it does, it does little or nothing for your cardiovascular risk but makes you more likely to die yeah it's, it's well done no, that does it for me I'll have plenty and it, it's only nine thousand pound a year so yeah. you can bank up the NHS while you're at it you know, it's so just, I mean, these things are just ridiculous. I know. Backing up a bit, though. So are there, I kind of interrupt you a bit uh, with my enthusiasm about I don't know. It was a good, um, good but in terms of risk factors you should consider, are there any major ones that we didn't? I mean, you can go on and on and on, but there's the kind of Pareto principle. Do you think we've covered the, the Pareto principle of risk management? Risk consideration. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think to me, uh, well, I mean, because the, the whole exercise is good. Put it that way. I'm not disagreeing with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, relaxation is good, uh, which is kind of the stress thing. Not smoking, we know that. I think air pollution is an unconsidered thing, which a lot of people haven't looked at, and um, and uh, I think that is still quite an important one. You mm. know, if you are in a really polluted, smoky micro particle environment i think you need you do need to look at that i mean i, I hate the idea of everyone wearing masks but if you're walking around the center of london and getting exhaust fumes blown on you day in and day out this is a problem it does cause heart disease um and for quite a lot of people and also the other chemicals that you breathe in with the um with the pollution um, the diesel particulates, yeah. particulates yeah diesel particulates nanoparticles um but also i mean it was interesting that um before they took lead out of car exhausts you remember there's about 200,000 tons was blown into the air every year in america and the last time i looked and this is published in the lancet they still believe that 250,000 cardiovascular deaths a year are caused by historical lead pollution yeah. so so these things are important now you can measure the lead in your blood if you want and there are i mean this is a this is a fun i didn't really cover it in the book but or did I? I can't remember whether I left it in or took it out now. But um, if you have a high lead level, it is actually possible to remove toxic metals from your blood using a thing called chelation therapy, yeah. which I always used to think was just nonsense. Um, I thought this is like super nonsense. Um, chelation is good science. Yes, well, yeah. it, well, it is good science. Uh, and as it turns out, that um, they tried to do a study to prove that it wouldn't work, and then they found that it did. Um, which is always the best sort of study. And they did it in the States and everyone was like jumping up and down going, this is a terrible study. It should never have been done. In fact, people tried to stop it being done. They actually deliberately tried to prevent it from being done. And then when it was done, it was positive. And now they're doing another follow-up one. But you know, heavy metals or toxins in your bloodstream, well, of course, they're doing the same thing as smoking or whatever. They're damaging your endothelial cells. And we know that they do this and they increase the chance of of blood clotting. So if you have these things, less people have them now, we're in a less polluted environment, but it, it may still be worth for people who are in their sort of 60s and 70s thinking about it and saying, is it worth getting it checked? Because there is 
there is a form of treatment that, 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 that has been proven to, to work. So, I mean, I wouldn't say that's a big one for a lot of people, but if it's still causing 250,000 deaths a year in the States, that's that's more than like COVID and nobody gives a stuff about it. That's an eyelid, I know. So my, which brings me to my final question, Malcolm, which is we've talked about um, how you would know your risk. I think the final bit of the jigsaw for me is risk mitigation strategies. So whether or not you know your risk and whether you know you go to your GP and have all the tests done or not, all of us, I think, would like to reduce our cardiovascular risk. So what are um, Kendrick's top tips for cardiovascular risk reduction? Well, you know, when I did write this in the book, I can't remember what I wrote now. So um, <laughs> I can probably help uh, you out if you get stuck. <laughs> all right. Well, I, yeah, we, we've probably got very similar ones. I mean, I think it, it's like living this the, the, the healthy lifestyle. Uh, haven't, we haven't really kicked on diet, but I mean, I think that if you if you've got problems with blood sugar levels being high, yeah. is to reduce the carbohydrates in your in your diet because that really causes problems and and it and it stimulates all sorts of nasty downstream things and some people can cope or appear to be able to cope with carbohydrate out of carbohydrate without any problem but yeah. there's a high proportion of people who have a problem and if you have a problem like you're putting on weight you're putting on central fat if you like central obesity if this is happening to you or you run a blood test and find that your blood sugar is not necessarily high enough to say you've got diabetes but it's raised yeah i think you need to cut down on the carbohydrates you just absolutely have to yeah and it's sad yeah. to say that also don't drink alcohol late at night because then your body can't use up the other systems properly so you're left in this constantly kind of high carbohydrate using system yeah and 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 this runs into problems so that's a dietary issue yeah. not for everybody and also I, I, the other thing sorry we looked at, I, was, I looked at that was high intensity exercise yeah. short burst high intensity exercise yeah. is good for that Whereas actually long runs and whatever are much less good for this because your body goes into a completely different metabolic system. So high intensity exercise, yeah. and cutting down the carbohydrates, very effective at reducing your risk due to this raised blood sugar issue, which on a population basis is probably the biggest risk that we've got. Yeah, I think because also if you are stressed, if you're under chronic stress, you will get the same kind of problems with your cardiac car with your carbohydrate metabolism. So you've, again, you've got to lower this thing down. So, you know, if you are in a stressful job, meditate. If you aren't exercising, exercise. Yeah. If you are eating too many carbohydrates, don't, you know, start eating them. Um, avoid smoking clearly and obviously. You yeah. know, avoid yeah. highly polluted um, and toxic environments. And again, obviously. If your blood pressure is high, then another thing that you can try is actually potassium consumption. If you increase that, that will likely lower your blood pressure. Yeah. And also potassium lowers down some quite damaging systems that are designed to get your blood pressure up with damaged blood vessels. So potassium intake is quite important on this one. I also recommend vitamin D yeah. during the winter time because vitamin D has, has a million effects, but cardiovascular prevention effects. Yeah. And I also advise um, just clunking about a gram of vitamin C a day because that has quite important cardiovascular protection effects as well and then when you go beyond these things you're looking at slightly more specific issues um, cover the vitamin c briefly because you do that in the book rather well and we can't make our own vitamin c no whereas many man mammals can and it has a huge role in cardiovascular uh, epithelial integrity doesn't it yeah well um yes for some reason 40 million years ago we <laughs> let me start probably something about this size as a shrew lost the ability to make vitamin C and we no longer can. Um, now that is not a problem most of the time for most people, I suppose. And in the past, there was plenty of vitamin C in the diet. Yeah. Um, but if you don't synthesize vitamin C and you get low in vitamin C, vitamin C is critical for the production of collagen, which is a support protein in all your, in all your body and in your blood vessels. So your blood vessels can crack. When they crack, obviously, that causes blood clots to form on them. And, and specifically, um, that can cause atherosclerosis if you're not careful. And people who have a high level of a particular lip, lip, lipoprotein, lipoprotein A, which is never normally measured. LP little a, yeah. LP little a, which is actually LDL with an extra, an extra protein attached. This sticks to the area of damage very tightly. It's a kind of like a plug. 
which is designed to keep you alive if your vitamin D C levels drop. And animals that don't have vitamin C synthesis have LPA, and uh, we have LPA. And uh, if the level is in your blood is high, then if you get a crack in your blood vessel caused by anything, you know, or the other things I talked about causing endothelial damage, the yeah. clot that is formed becomes much more difficult to be got rid of for all sorts of reasons. And therefore, um, I would advise the vitamin C as make sure there's nothing causing your blood vessels to crack. Because and it's cheap and it's universally available, so it's, it's nothing cheap, it's, it's cheap as chips, isn't it? I mean, I take it as a powder, yeah, which is horrible, but apparently that's the best way to do it. It tastes ugh, but more absorbable. If you, stir it up, if you stir it up and drink it quickly, uh, it, it, it works all right. And you know, what harm can it do? And particularly, um, if people get infections like viral infections or or even with COVID, I advise people get your vitamin C up, yeah, because COVID is, is ripping your endothelial cells you know and and causing blood clotting if you're not careful but vitamin c just also vitamin c is used by cells to protect themselves when they're under assault so it keeps them healthy and, and animals that are infected raise their vitamin c production hugely to like 20 yeah. grams a day or whatever yeah. and we can't. Um, we can't do that so yeah. but there's a very important well i think and, and and there's been some quite important research and there's a lot of people who believe that you know we should be giving vitamin c in high quantities to people who are seriously ill with with um covid in hospital the chinese were doing it there's a few cardiologists in the uk that are now trying to convince everyone to do it i, I can't see why you wouldn't do this but um so so the, so there's that that's a thing when you're when you're when you're otherwise unwell is when you need vitamin c you may not need it other times it's got rid of fairly quickly but you know if you're feeling a bit unwell whack it in there as much as you can tolerate so sort of typically, of course, it was, um, it was uh, you know, when they tried to research vitamin C, um, by Linus Pauling was a big vitamin C promoter. Yeah, yeah. And he said, well, if you take 10 grams a day, you'll never get anything, which, which I'm not entirely sure about. But yeah. anyway, so they said, oh, well, we'll do some research. And they gave people something like 100 milligrams and said, oh, well, you haven't... Give them a homeopathic them. dose. Don't find any benefits. The the yeah, yeah. Of, Same with vitamin then, D. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Linus Pauling was wrong. I said, well, he was telling you to take 10 grams and you took a hundredth of that. And now you're saying it doesn't work. Oops. <laughs> anyway, that, as you know, that, that, that the research into, uh, research into vitamins is particularly flawed. I didn't use the word corrupt, but I might do if somebody, if somebody yeah. poked me. Yeah. It's ridiculous, isn't it? You know? um, are there anyway, any other, but, uh, fundamental preventive strategies? Or do you think we've, uh, for me, sleep? It's the other big, big... Uh, well, yeah, you, you'd be along with Phil. Haven't done that one. This, 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 I'm not being rude. This is just my new toy, my aura ring. Yeah. Well, I think we don't get enough sleep. And if you if you if you don't get sleep, your your neurohormonal system, your stress system, gets kicked all around the place. And and it's interesting. You watch um, that the people who work shift work are much more likely to get heart disease and okay. cancer, and all sorts yeah. of really horrible yeah. things. We. We really need to sleep, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> and we need good quality sleep if we can get it. Uh, uh, and, and that's really important. Yeah. No, I mean, it is it's something that's under under um, um, sort of uh, appreciated, I think. I haven't talked about it much in the book, but you, you run out of things after a while. You think, well, I don't want to tell people to do it. Uh, they'll just say, well, I can't do all of that. It's impossible. I'm no. So, look, I'm... All we've done is scratch the surface. That's probably an appropriate way to put it. Of yeah, yeah. scratch the end of the. We have merely scratched scratched the end of the yeah. Um, so once again, Mike, uh, Malcolm, um, people, where can people get the book? What are the plans for the well, book? Um, if they could go, to, well, if, if, I prefer if they can go to my blog, which is drmalcolmkendrick.org, where you can you can link into it and order it from there, or from the publishers, the Columbus Publishing. Now the reason. So this is that um, there's a certain large company that sounds like a big river in uh, South America. Um, that takes that the one that the LDL molecules have to go from one side and come at, Your book has to pop out the other side of the um, yeah, well, uh, and of the Amazon jungle. Have yeah, been, has been removed by a, a large river in South America. So uh, yeah. when you're when so I kind of don't like that very much. So yeah, they can get it from there. You can get it from obviously the large river in South America um, as a as a Kindle version as well. Um, some people have talked about uh, an audio book, which 
which I haven't done yet because there's diagrams in it and I can't quite see how you can describe a diagram because they won't let you describe diagrams in the audible books. You just have to read the words. Yeah. Like, well, that doesn't make any sense because I have to describe the bloody diagram. Yeah. I mean, it's like, oh, just, anyway. You uh, but anyway, that's, that's yeah. the, hmm. if people want to go to the blog, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick dot org. Um, it, and your blog is wonderful. It, it really is. It's absolute mine of information. Uh, the other point uh, I haven't made is is the way that you talk is the way that you write. Um, I love your writing style because it's um, all the science is there, but it's done in, a, in your kind of laconic, um, slightly offbeat, you know, way with your particular sense of humor and that comes across in the book and it makes what could be an incredibly technical and dull subject actually really engaging well thank you for that i mean i try to um i know that myself uh, a bit of um a wise man once said that um humor is just a, a funny way of being serious but it also makes it more readable i think i hope and, and, and i mean some people hate it because you're talking about a serious subject how can you possibly write a joke you know it's like um well, it worked for me. Well, yeah, well, I think, you know, one thing I have learned, you can't please everybody all the time. Yeah. yeah. Number one. But if enough people think it's at least you're going to get an occasional an occasional laugh, then... Um, no, it is. It, 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 it produced lots of right smiles along the way and the occasional guffaw, I must say. So yeah. um, is there anything that I haven't asked you or that you feel that we should, as we close, that, that we should cover? Yeah, well, no, I mean, I think that hopefully that's given, hopefully it's given people a kind of overview of what I'm talking about. I think it's it's covered it pretty well. Um, it, it's always quite hard to describe this because without going off down various alleyways that I'm interested in, but I realise that Not nobody's really. very interested in it. I mean, I am I am an uber geek, in fact, uh, I can't help it. Um, but, um, and then people can read and, and I hope get an idea. Um, it's not rocket science in a way it's sort of almost like saying to people live life like people used to live a thousand years ago or something or not quite obviously but if you know what i mean this is not just saying to people we, we we've created a lifestyle for ourselves that is is, is relatively toxic in yeah. many different ways and we have to try and remember what what were we designed to do how were we designed to live how, how should true. we be living yeah. you know we should leave, be exercising life yeah, it yeah. eats a species appropriate diet, leave us yeah. leave appropriate species appropriate lifestyle, and let evolution do the rest for you. I mean, I, I think the book is actually immensely reassuring. It's not yeah, a, well, it's not a scary book. It's a very reassuring one. Well, I think it, I'm hoping it is. And so mm -hmm. it's quite simple. It's in your control. But you know, stay away from. I think just well, I don't want to say I'm a doctor. You know, stay away from all these medications some people need some medications obviously but I, yeah, yeah i think it's just gone it's gone bonkers especially in these areas because Absolutely. raised cholesterol the raised bad cholesterol level raised blood sugar level raised blood pressure these are these are the three biggies for the industry because they know that once they've got you on a drug for this this is going to be for the rest of your life yeah you know you get an antibiotic that's one week once they don't make much money out of that you're on a, a cholesterol lowering drug, then that is forever. And therefore the profits that can be made in these areas are astronomical. And I think that's distorted things really, really badly. I, I say this a lot. I, mean, you know, I, I call myself the pharmacist that gave up drugs. And I yeah. very much feel that we're up against these two huge paradigms of big food on the one hand and big pharma on the other. Um, and yeah. actually, that, that, that will be a lovely seg segue, actually, Malcolm. So if you will indulge me with a second mystery guest appearance when we could talk about doctoring data and the way all of this stuff is spun to our disadvantage, I'd love to have you yeah. back and discuss yeah. it. Well, no, that would be fine. I think I'll have to, um, I'll have to um, sort of regain some energy levels. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I think, um, you know, people, you know, since just education, hopefully, People find it interesting at the same time. They think, "Oh gosh, that's interesting," and whatever. And, it is, and that's the ideal thing, isn't it? But I think people are, are are not equipped nowadays to to deal with the information that comes at them without, you know, they're just bombarded, and it, it's just too much. And, and just trying to get some critical analysis, I think, it, it, it is important. It, so hopefully, it, that would be good. 
It's been wonderful for me. And as I say, I think I've finally understood it because of the way that you explained it to me. I, I can never totally understand this whole way that I, I knew that the saturated fat was a load of rubbish, but I kind of swallowed the LDL story. But it, it never really, you know, gelled. And now I know why it gelled. That didn't gel because actually it was wrong. Yeah. Now, now you've provided me with a cogent and convincing argument. So well, um, you. you've been really generous with your time. Really appreciate your book. Um, we'll put all the relevant links in, this, in the show notes. And once again, thanks for coming on and uh, see you soon. No, I enjoyed the chat. Thanks very much. You kept me Thank on track. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. If you enjoyed the podcast and want to find out more, join our Wellness and Pro Longevity Facebook group. Don't forget to subscribe and follow so you never miss an episode and maybe share to friends and family who might benefit. Finally, if you think you might need help with diabetes, heart disease or any of the other diseases we discuss, then book a free consultation with Graham. There's absolutely no charge for this and we would never put you under any pressure. What do you have to lose? Bye for now and see you for the next episode.